Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Friedman. It's the end of week five, our first week, but not our last, on actual play. This week has been celebrating and using kind of as a scientific or really scientistic kind of control the idea of one DM in two very different shows. On Tuesday, we talked about Dimension 20's Misfits and Magic, which is an edited down uh, actual play that includes illustrations and other kinds of graphic engagement to tighten up the viewing experience. Runs for no more than usually about two hours. Today, we went big. And students intellectually knew that uh, Critical Role's Exandria Unlimited is a longer viewing experience. After all, in week two, they read about me talking about narrative time in Critical Role. They know it's hundreds of hours. But even four hours can be intense. And so one of the things that we talked about today was what is that kind of viewing experience like compared to other genres and other kinds of assigned reading? When I assign an academic piece of literature um, in terms of scholarly criticism, I expect students to pay attention to every word uh, to get a sense of the full argument and that everything is absolutely essential because things are often cut down for time, for space. But an actual play like Critical Role or other actual plays that are run largely without internal edits operate in a different way in terms of our attention. And this is something that we haven't really talked about in criticism just yet because as it's really exciting to note, actual plays are an emerging genre where the rules and rhythms of them are still being codified. So we talked about, uh, as we did on Tuesday, you know, how do you pay attention? What do you focus on? And as I talked to my students on Tuesday, you know, this is something that we do while doing other things for many uh, viewers. Oh, there's never been a comprehensive survey of viewers of actual plays. Uh, it's something that I have thought about getting IRB approval for, but, you know, I do so many research projects, so it hasn't happened yet but maybe you'll do it. So we talked a little about what drew their attention. What was compelling to them? What did they focus on? Um, many folks, once again, and perhaps more so even than Tuesday, noted Abria as a cinematic form of Dungeon Master, um, who uses a lot of the vocabulary of film, um, including you know her final In Exandria Unlimited kind of uh, you know, inter, you know, final clips uh, that are just her looking at the camera uh, for particular kinds of impact. Abria understands this format as a format that is about the audience, which is an interesting innovation, particularly for Critical Role, where the idea of almost voyeuristic kind of eavesdropping on a group of friends at the table is often the kind of narrative scope or frame uh, through which we view the, the experience. As I talked about when I talked about uh, my work writing about Critical Role, that's part of the appeal. And it's been interesting to see how Exandria Unlimited has managed to preserve that feeling of friends at the table with people who didn't know each other as well before they started playing. Many people drew attention to, in their annotations to Liam O'Brien talking about um, kind of the act of friendship making at the table that comes up in this particular episode, episode four, By the Road, um, which begins with a lot of combat. I had thought about potentially cutting this down, and maybe I will in a future iteration of this class, to just the pageant part of this episode, which comes in the second half, and is only part of the second half. But what I found really interesting when I was talking to students today was the idea that combat, something that they'd really only seen fully fleshed out in this actual play so far in our viewing experiences, was the most compelling thing for a lot of folks, which shouldn't surprise me. I'm at a big football school. 
The idea of actual play's connection in a very nerdy ass kind of way to the kind of rhythms and feel of watching um, sports is very clear for some of our class participants, which I think is really interesting because, you know, depending on the way that combat is playing out and depending on the duration of combat, sometimes that's the part where I'm like, okay, well, everyone's going to take their turn and there might be a clutch move, but maybe I can go to get a soda. And it was interesting for us to kind of compare our different kinds of reactions, which also led to some really interesting questions. One of our, several of our classmates are critters, fans of Critical Role. Um, and so we were able to kind of balance the experienced voices in the room with the kind of totally new voices. And as I told the kind of newbies who are feeling very intimidated by, you know, the kind of large sweep, What's really useful is when we started to kind of generate questions that we want to bring to our, um, you know, class visitors next week, their questions were often the most salient, were the most um, kind of getting at the heart of something really important, right? Um, and some of those were mechanical things about the game. Some of those are production questions about how things are made um, and what the experience is like. What I love about this is while there are some things that I'm able to answer because Tox Machina has been such a rich resource thanks to Brian Foster, and there's been a fair amount of certain kinds of transparency um, in terms of critical role, and then of course in terms of Dimension 20, a lot of their questions are questions that only people who have experienced it can answer, which is why I'm so excited that I was able to tell my students, not only is Abria coming next Thursday, but B. Dave Walters has kindly offered to come and talk to us on Tuesday. I can't tell you how excited I am about both of these guests as kind of a dream team. They're folks who have deep connections to the world of tabletop role playing, not only as um, DMs and players, but also through their other connections to the industry as as writers and makers and, you know, kind of they're deeply enmeshed. I have joked, and it's not really a joke, that there's an essay to be written, and maybe it should be written by B-Dave, about the kinds of hub and spoke nature of the network of actual play folks. If you visualize it, as I've started to do um, for a project, What's really particularly interesting is the ways in which kind of people know each other, right? This is a community that works on professional connections, like many professional um, networks do. And one of the things I talked about with my students is what I'm excited about in terms of B. Dave and Abria is we can think about them, or at least I do, as kind of peers in a different set of industries, which is to say we're roughly about the same age and we're roughly about the same kind of level in our respective, you know, fields of endeavor. I'm excited for the possibilities um, of my former student, London Carlisle, who uh, is an a working actor, He's, uh, which is why it's hard to get a hold of him. Uh, he is in, at the Alliance in Atlanta doing a show, so we are working around his rehearsal schedule. Um, but I'm hoping he can come and give a perspective from someone who is um, closer to the start of their career for what it's like to be a kind of person who's navigating the world of actual play now that it's been become more established. But next week, we're talking to folks who are kind of at the height of the game, but who also have a lot of other uh, pans in the fire. So we're going to be talking about things like you know, ratios of, of time and focus. And, you know, as B. Dave, uh, you know, said to me, how you get started as an English major in this business, which of course I appreciate a great deal. I'm really excited for these possibilities, both as a teacher with a classroom full of amazing students, but also as a researcher who is thinking and writing about all of this stuff at the same time. It's in that sense that I'm really excited that we were able to start a conversation that I think is gonna keep going about the representation of the South in role-playing games, especially these fantasy role-playing games. Um, today, it was primarily talking about Byroden, which is um, a location that we knew about, um, we, the viewers of Critical Role Campaign One, as the home of 
uh, Liam O'Brien and Laura Bailey's characters, Vex and Vax. But we didn't go back there. We didn't know anything about it. And so it became a place that um, Abria could take advantage of and that and in ways that were potentially generative. And one of the things that I fastened on was precisely the fact that on Twitter, both of them have talked extensively about the development process for creating by Roden as inspired by Laredo, Texas, a place that my students, not being from Texas, are not super familiar with. But it's important to remember that Laredo, Texas is a border town, uh, specifically with Nuevo Laredo, um, kind of deeply interconnected with its Mexican sister city. It's also fascinating to me, and when I uh, look at the pageant part of this particular episode, I think a lot about George Washington Day and the George Washington Parade and the kind of depictions of 18th century-ness that are deeply indebted to the aesthetics of, say, the quinceanera dress. Um, or kind of southern bellness of a century later. And one of the things that my students, who are largely from the U.S. South, picked up on is the way that while the specific reference is Laredo, Texas, the trappings of Byroden were very resonant to many of them who are from small towns in the South, um, who are from the South in general. Um, as Abria has said, the notion of rebuilding after disaster is deeply indebted to the Gulf Coast states, which as someone who is uh, you know, keenly aware of hurricane season at all times, um, because that's how I grew up, I am deeply, uh, deeply uh, a fan of seeing in kind of that lived experience expressed in, you know, the role-playing games that I watch. We're going to explore this further in the weeks to come because we're going to listen to at least one episode of Not Another D&D Podcast or Mad Pod because another one of my favorite role-playing players, Emily Axford, uh, performs a uh, Moonshine Sybin, who is a Crick elf, whose character formation in her context is deeply indebted to notions of Appalachia. And for those of you who don't know a whole lot about the U.S. South, here in central Alabama, we are not far from the foothills of the Appalachian mountain range. Uh, so many of our students have that as a very close reference as well. Um, so we're going to explore this question more. Um, as we're going to explore a lot more questions, the stars and wishes are just delightful. Um, so next week we have B Dave and Abria, and so we're they, the students have a buffet of choices of uh, content that has been created by both of them that they, that is linked on Canvas. Everything from Into the Motherlands, where Abria performs and B Dave is on the creative team, um, to different kinds of advice content that B Dave has recorded to the many pieces of content that Abria has done recently, both as player and as DM, as well as interviews that she's done for D&D Beyond. Um, uh, and so they'll have a kind of pick and mix um, pedagogically to kind of lampshade this um, or make it clear. We're in a hard part of the semester where for a lot of classes, exams ha have just happened. Um, there's a lot of stress and of course we're in a freaking pandemic. So students are reporting more fatigue and stress than they were a few weeks ago. So it seems like a good idea to have the structure of here's these different pieces of content, all of which are interesting and rich. You can consume them however you wish. Like if you want to listen to it while you're walking your dog, that's great. You know, you don't have to go to a coffee shop. We're not going to do any formal critical reading next week. We're just going to get a deeper sense of these artists and creators work. Um, and then we'll come back to uh, some of the stuff of the wish lists thereafter. So some of the things that our students have asked for um, is they'd want to play some more games. Um, specific requests were for something space or sci-fi, something cozy, um, or something with uh, fall, autumn, or Halloween spooky. Um, Top of my list is the One Shot 10 Candles. We'd have to play it with a couple of tables of folks, um, but it's a GM-less system, uh, so that's a possibility. Um, it does involve fire, so we'll, 
I'm pretty sure that'll be fine with our people in our building. It's fine. Everything is fine. Um, there's been some requests to further dive into how game mechanics affect storytelling, um, what goes into a, making a game system, how DMs prepare for games and character development. And of course, thinking about how DMs prepare for a game and how characters are created um, and process behind writing campaigns are very much things that we can kind of tap into B. Dave and Abria's expertise on. Um, the next week, uh, we'll have Tim Hutchings to come and talk about uh, what goes into making a game system. You may know him from uh, A Thousand Year Old Vampire, which is a game we dipped into earlier in the semester, um, but I wanted to let it percolate and for students to spend a little bit more time outside of class playing it before we brought Tim in. I'm really excited because Tim is also um, kind of someone who is in academic spaces teaching, so we're able to have a kind of reciprocal class visit sort of scenario, and uh, is a thoughtful artist and maker um, who's really smart. I mean, man, the number of really smart people who volunteered to come and talk about their stuff. And as I've talked to my students, you know, there's a distinction to be made between people who are amazing performers um, who uh, who do amazing and moving things and people who can talk about their process. And that is not a completely overlapping set of layers of the pie. There is a Venn diagram. But I have been so fortunate um, to be in contact with folks who are in that sweet spot. Um, and uh, it's just such a gift um, to be very transparent about it. This is a class that I hope to offer again. And so we're trying to do this as well as possible. So it's a positive experience for everybody. Um, in our theater department where we have a BFA in musical theater, as well as other BFA programs in um, other aspects of theater, we have visiting artists when there's not a pandemic. And so we're very hopeful that we might start to relationship build with folks who might want to come for a couple of weeks and be in residence and talk about, you know, their work and their process in different kinds of ways, especially since, you know, we teach classes on voice acting. We teach classes on um, these sorts of performance questions, and it's always lovely to have practitioners. It's obviously a whole lot easier to make the ask uh, when it's a Zoom session, uh, but you know, we're hoping to put our best foot forward next week. So we brainstormed some questions. I think there's some really great questions that are in the air. And of course, I have so many of my own. Um, I'm hoping not to suck up the air. It's an interesting balance. I, I think partly because of fatigue and partly because of shyness and partly because of just the weird nature of our camera setup in our active learning classroom. It's wired all for sound, but uh, there's one camera in the top of the ceiling that gives you a few a full view of the whole classroom, but focused on the podium where I would stand if I was like lecturing, even though it's a decentered classroom. And then there's monitors on two sides where if you're zooming in, that's where you see our participants. So it's a fascinating experience. Um, it's a weird one. And of course we're all masked because again, we're in a pandemic. But so I'm really excited about the weeks to come. Um, my students agree with me that if all we had for the rest of the semester was an unending chain of, of creatives who we can pick their brain in different kinds of ways, that we would all be really happy and that would be a very exciting way to learn. Um, of course, the structure of the class with contract grading means that a lot of creative consuming and thinking is being done individually by students or in smaller groups. Um, so we can spend the time together having those kinds of conversations, drawing from our different levels of expertise. I've been so grateful to uh, the students who have experience from our tabletop role-playing club, who have gamely volunteered to run uh, sessions for people who are new to D&D &D or who want to try new systems that they haven't encountered before, which is just an, an amazing, I mean, obviously it is part of their coursework um, for this class. They're, you know, they are getting something out of it, but, you know, I know as better than, than most that, you know, to ask someone to run a game for you or to have someone offer to run a game for you is an amazing gift. And I think that's what's really been heartwarming, 
you know, we could be very cynical. And I think I often am inclined to as a, as a person who knows a lot about the history of literary and cultural institutions as, you know, how the sausage is made, right? Um, that uh, there's, there are ugly sides to this. I mean, there's, and, and, you know, commercialization is rough and competition is a thing. But what's been really lovely is the ways in which while this class has not shied away from thinking about those things, as well as all the other kinds of uglinesses under the rock of uh, TRPG culture, because it's a human culture, like every other culture, um, that there's been this experience uh, by me and my students of generosity. And we need so much kindness and grace and generosity with one another these days. Um, and I was prepared, I think at the beginning of this semester, to be a person extending that kind of grace and generosity. And it's been just really lovely to feel that kind of come back. So if you're watching this and you've said something about like following uh, this class because you're interested in it, um, even though you're not my student, thanks. It, this is really great. This has been a really positive experience and I hope it, it, it continues. Um, and uh, it's, it's, this is primarily for my students, my students who are not here, but I think you're the, there's an imagined interlocutor as well who is the person thinking about teaching this class or the person who wishes they could take this class or, or what have you. Um, I will offer this class again. It's my very deep hope. Um, and I will talk at the end of the semester um, probably more or in a kind of supplemental video as we get closer to registration and things like that about how that kind of mechanically works in my teaching load, um, my plans for incorporating this kind of material in the other courses that I'm, you know, contractually more likely to be teaching. Um, one final note, uh, both for my students and for those of you who are watching this video, um, next week is going to be weird because uh, we are having kind of a full interview Q&A sort of situation. Um, so we will be on Zoom um, in, a, in such a way that um, the students who are not able to attend in person will be able to attend virtually. And if they do need to um, kind of consume the content uh, asynchronously, they won't need a recap from me. So next week's recaps are going to be a little bit different. Um, they will not be uh, the recorded sessions of our inter, our kind of uh, Q and A's uh, with B Dave and Abria. Uh, I want to keep those as safe spaces for everybody involved to be as candid as they feel like they can be, um, and also student privacy and also all those sorts of things. Um, I will recap. Um, I think some meditations on class visits, um, on uh, asking good questions uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, just for those of you who are uh, watching along from outside of our classroom experience. Uh, so there will be content next week, um, but it will be uh, a little bit different than in uh, weeks past because on Canvas, in our kind of private locked down to the class space, um, the full uh, class experience will be available to uh, to our students who are, you know, for whatever reason, not in person. So, so yeah, this has been actual play week. Um, didn't know that whether this was going to be the first of many. Uh, certainly didn't expect what's coming next week. Uh, it seems very clear that students uh, want more actual play content, but one shots and shorter duration. Uh, so my research task over the next week or so is to assemble a list of two hours or less podcasts and actual play VODs, uh, which is a little bit of a challenge. Um, it may be leaning more on kind of D&D &D live kinds of content. Um, if you have recommendations for things that you think I might not have on my radar, but might be um, valuable viewing experiences for uh, students, then by all means, put them in the comments or you can tweet at me at 
Freed, F-R-I-E-D-E. Of course, if you're my student, I'll see you in class, on Discord, and on Canvas. Have a great weekend, guys. <laughs>